Good morning from the malting farm cabins in Little Bentley, right up in northeastern Essex. This is where we ended the last video and spending the night in a 300 acre farm with the jacuzzi just in the back, the cornfields, hair running around all over the place. It's, it's an amazing, amazing experience and there is no sign of any other life from all of our view. I'm sure you can hear it now, just birds singing everywhere. It's stunning. Plan for the day. We're about to head off in half an hour or so, and we're then heading to two small towns which became infamous for witch hunting around 400 years or so ago. And after that, we're then heading right up into the very northeastern part of Essex to the town of Harwich. So we're going to soak in the last few minutes we've got here because it has been completely magical. And then we'll pack up the bike and head off. I hope the weather stays like this because it is beautiful and it defies the forecast because it may have rained a bit in the evening as you can see from the bike but it's blue sky at the moment so fingers crossed it stays like it. Welcome to Manningtree. This is one of the smallest towns in England and it's got an infamous past because the self-appointed witch master general, Matthew Hopkins, lived in this very town. He was the most ruthless witch finder in England's history. In the three years that he was in his self-appointed role, he created the title, the witch master general. He hung more women for crimes against or for crimes of witchcraft than in the previous one hundred years of England's history. He set on trial 300 women of the local area in total for crimes of witchcraft. And this old pub here that's now in a slight state of needing to be repaired, you can just see the sign on the glass window, it's the White Hart Pub. Said to be about 400 years old and said to be one of the key places that Matthew Hopkins and his associates would meet with the accusers to decide the fate of these accused witches. This is the village green of Manningtree and if we go back Matthew Hopkins, a witch finder general, was witch finder general from 1644 to 1647. Right here in this exact spot in 1645 four women were hung for being accused of being witches. Right in this spot but the interesting thing is, to be accused of being a witch and to be tried as being a witch, you had to have people testifying against you. And these are local women. And for these four women to be hung, 92 local people had to testify against them. So yes, Matthew Hopkins as a witch finder general was prolific in his witch finding, but you needed a whole community to come together and testify against these women. It must have been a petrifyingly scary time if you're a local woman here just fearing that one day maybe if you happen to buy a cat for example your neighbor will look out the window and think I think she could be a witch what do we think should we uh 
meet in the, the White Hart pub and have a chat about her behind her back. The things these min windows must have seen. Bonneville didn't start this morning when I tried getting it going at the cabin. So I got the screwdriver out, took off the side panel and went to cross the starter solenoid terminals. Wasn't starting, wasn't starting, just ticking over but not sparking up. And then I realized after about three minutes and honestly thinking the whole day would be a write-off, I realized that the key, I took the key out after the initial failure to start, so I was trying to jump start it by crossing the start cell lines with no key in the ignition. Oh, so stupid, so, so stupid. Must have been about three attempts away from the battery just completely dying. Right, we're off to the next spot, which is the village of Missley. I think that's about a mile down the road or so. Welcome to the village of Missley, population two and a half thousand, and it's known as the village of what might have been, because 250 years ago there were grand plans to turn this village into a saltwater spa town. The plans went bankrupt and there are now just two surviving bits of architecture from those grand plans. Number one, the Swan Fountain, and number two, the two towers that we just went past which form part of a semi-deconstructed church. So I'm hoping we'll be able to get inside and have a look. And that is next up. In fact, I can see them right here, right in the distance, about 200 meters away. Let's see if we can get in and have a look inside. Okay, keys picked up and luckily I've just seen, it says there, keys available. So you won't look ridiculous going in to ask. It is the correct procedure to get the key. So here, you may wonder, this doesn't really look like it makes much sense as a church. This used to be connected and formed one, I've seen the plans, very beautiful church, but it was built in 1776, under 100 years later, it was knocked down, 1870, the middle part was knocked down and replaced with uh, a more fashionable church just down the road. So all that they kept are these two towers. Very interesting. This, this church was meant to be an especially beautiful church, very grand, and be at the core of what would have been the saltwater spa town. So they would have had to make it look as nice as possible, and this side gives a much better idea of what the church would have been like when it was in its full state. Oh, these would be the Ten Commandments, I guess, written up here. It's quite interesting reading all of these because Matthew Hopkins, the, the witch master general, of course, he was prolific and he lived in both Missley and Manning Tree. Just interesting reading the commandments. No, thou shalt not do murder. This church would have come about a hundred years after him, although he was fairly well praised for the good work he did. And then you get a kind of conflict, thou shalt not do murder. Well, where's the line of murder? I'm doing a good deed. Before 
we head off for lunch, I want to show you this. This is Hopping Bridge and bodies of water like this one were supposedly the areas for one of the witch tests because if you were a witch, you had to fill one of the criteria. You had to either be old, and this is true, it's incredible. You had to be old or have a mole or have a cat, not feel pain or, or and this is key to this area, float. If you would float, then you would be a witch. If you would sink, then you wouldn't be a witch. So they'd tie the supposed witches to chairs, push them into the body of water like this one here. And if they'd sink, great, they're not a witch. And if they'd float, they'd be a witch. The problem with that is, if you're not a witch, you're going to drown. So it's lose-lose for the women. You drown, great, you're not a witch, but you're dead. You float, well, great. You haven't died this time, but they're gonna pull you back in and hang you for being a witch anyway. What a lovely setting. Right in front of the fountain where we're at earlier. This pub is one year off its 300th year anniversary. And the interesting thing is, the building just before this was also a pub, and it's the pub that Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder, or the witch hunter, used to frequent. And it's the exact spot where they used to hand out and deliver a lot of the prosecutions in the pub that stood just before this one. We're sitting outside because the weather is actually a lot nicer than I thought. Monica, if you pass me the camera, I'll show you what it's like inside because I love coming to these old pubs. They're all very unique in their character. So I think this was re-established in 2004, but you can see it's got all of the old exposed woodwork, but beautifully refurbished with the bar in the middle there. Love that old dark exposed wood, so beautiful. Upstairs is a hotel, so you can actually stay here and then come down, grab a pint, grab dinner in the evening. Lose through there. Just squeeze past the team here. Thanks. Got the old exposed brickwork with the fireplace there. Just beautiful, beautiful setting. delicious they've got an excellent selection of food there so highly highly recommended we're now refueled and ready to go for the final afternoon of our two-day visits Essex adventure we're here at the moment on the blue dot and we need to get to the absolute most north easterly point of the county of Essex to oh, just 19 minutes away just 19 minutes away to Harwich this just on the side of the the Misleaf Thorn pub where we've eaten. This is the first reference that we've seen to Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder. Two interesting things from this. The term hangers on. For example, if you go to a party and you're like, oh, there are a few hangers on, something like that. That term was used when they used to hang the witches. So they'd be hanging the witches and the people who wouldn't die fast enough from asphyxiation, you just have locals just grabbing their legs oh and ripping their legs down. Hangers on. Jesus. One other interesting thing I find this fascinating. Matthew Hopkins, he wrote a book about witch finding in, 19, or in 1647. That was published. It was then used as an official book for witch hunting that was used in New England, the USA. And they started doing witch hunting and trials from the following year that Matthew Hopkins' book was released.
course, the second time I've done that today. I tried riding off with my disc lock still on, and it's wedged on. Oh my god, it's broken. disintegrated and fell apart. The battery and everything. Oh my god. That is... Then it. Yeah. Just buy another one. Oh, I thought we won't be out going to be able to leave then. <laughs> That's the second time I've done that. I'm, I'd be amazed if I haven't done any damage to the disc. Mm. You've got to be so careful. I mean, look at what I've done to that. I mean, I'm preaching. You've got to be careful, obviously. I'm not remotely <laughs> careful. Twice today I've done that. Silly boy. Okay. How many people have done that? How many people have done that and actually dropped their bike after oh, going, yeah. I've come so close to taking off and dropping the bike. <sighs> really lucky, really lucky there. Okay, now we're definitely finally going to Harwich. Now the bike doesn't start. Yeah, bike doesn't start. Welcome to our final stop of this two-day adventure. The town of Harwich, and we're specifically going in here to Harwich Guildhall and the home of Harwich Town Council. This is one of the single most important towns in the history, the entire history of the USA. Before we go in, I just love this. When they convert the old banks into houses and flats, they always used to be the grandest buildings in town, the banks, but now, UK, same with a lot of places, they, you know, no one needs a physical bank anymore, so they turn them into shops, houses. And now time for this. I hope you're expecting us. Should I knock? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Harwich Guildhall. I've always wondered, what's actually inside these buildings? I could go on and on about the history of Harwich for too long, but a key point, Christopher Jones, who was the captain and part owner of the Mayflower ship, that was the ship that sailed off and set up the second colony of Brits over in the USA, and was one of the most instrumental ships to head over and shape the entire history of the USA. He is one of the most famous residents of this town, and he's named here in the 1604 Royal Charter. Now, to give you as brief a tour as possible, come in here because this building's about 350 years old. They were replastering the building, taking everything off, and have a look. Come in here, Monica. And this used to be a jail. Yeah, this used to be a jail. They were taking off all the plaster. And look what they uncovered underneath the plaster. Mm -hmm. This is the jail. You can see there from the tops. These would have been prisoners from the Napoleonic War, Napoleonic prisoners doing all of this graffiti. Mm -hmm. Different boats you can see there. And Monica found a very interesting thing, a man hanging there. Mm -hmm. You've even got names and dates, but this is, this is a prison with all of the graffiti there etched in from the prisoners. Apparently conditions would have been atrocious in here. Okay, if I come upstairs and we'll go through to one of the main meeting rooms that hasn't really changed in around about 
300, 350 years or so. Amazing to actually be inside and see it. It's almost impossible to fathom how important Harwich was and this building was in the history of so many things. All of the wars, whether it's the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, and also, also the, the American Revolution. You know, the history of Harwich with regards to the USA and so many of the wars has, has all been so significant. This was the key city, or the key town, I should say, with regards to so much military and naval history. This, and this room specifically, must have seen so many fascinating bits of history. You can see all of the councillors, the mayors of years gone by on the walls there. And then if we come through here, and these rooms are still used. So this would, I believe, be one of the meeting rooms. This vase was given by the Danish to the Brits after World War II to celebrate the reopening of the ferry lines or the ferry routes coming from Denmark back to the UK. And finally, if you can see here, not everyone will be allowed to come up here. We're going up to the top now. This is the archive area. And here we have, right at the top, the original bill of sale from 1673 of this building. And I've got one more thing to show because under here, the original town charter from 1604. Incredible to see it, 418 years old. There's one more room I want to try and get up to. Now, this isn't really available for most people to see, but it's right up in the attic. Whew. May get too dark. Let's see if I can get my phone out. It's right up in the attic. They've got a few old Union Jack flags, but more interestingly than that, they've got the original, you can see from about 400 years old, or 400 years ago, there are I'll flip the camera and do this. There are the original Roman numerals for how, how this whole building was, was due to be made. Almost think of it like a Kia flat pack. You'd have numbers four, fives, ones, twos, and people would know the builders how to correlate those Roman numerals and turn it into this building. So it's almost like a modern day flat pack type building, for example. Just got my phone there to show a bit of extra light. It's, well, I don't know if it's creepy, but it's certainly interesting. You've got the flags there. And then if you look at the side of bits of wood, you've got the Roman numerals here and they would have been labelled, so each piece of wood would have been labelled so the builders knew exactly where to put each piece of wood. We found it. The home of Captain Christopher Jones, Master of the Mayflower. So the captain of the Mayflower that sailed over with the pilgrims, the adventure seekers in 1620 to the USA, he lived in this house. Who would guess that, you know, a relatively unassuming house like this, the person that lived right there would be so key to the shaping of the USA 
from this house. Handmade trike, Kawasaki engine. <laughs> That's a real brat, rat looking three wheeler. It's a tank on the back. Surely that's just. So you don't need motorbike license. No, you don't. In fact, I don't even think you need to wear a helmet for one of these. Really? This, I mean, I love it. It's definitely but it been is made. It's as dangerous as a motorcycle. So. Yeah, but that's that's the level of coolness you go for. If you know, if you fancy the feeling of freedom, helmetless. That's been built in someone's shed, and I love it. Eight bars leaning back, toggle switch there. No idea what for. Well done to them. Well done. <laughs>this is the perfect spot for dinner we're right on the waterfront here and you can actually eat on the terrace it's about a 160 year old building that's been completely refurbished and renovated and you can see just all of the buildings along the waterfront here you know an indication of the the very very rich wealth that came from the naval strength of great britain over the years the menu here is brilliant. They've also got a very good reputation for their seafood. A little glass of wine because after this it's okay. We're not riding for a little while and that goes down extremely well. I had a warning come up on the Bonneville, which is parked right down there, you can see. Parked up nicely. As I got off the bike, I got a warning from my SysApp device and it said low battery. And that's because I was trying to start it out the key in it earlier. And I knew this would be a problem. I think I've only got one more start before I won't be able to start it anymore. We're off to one final stop, which is walking distance from here. So I think what we're going to do, leave the bike there, have dinner, then walk off to a final spot because I don't know if the Bonneville's going to start anymore. And then walk back to Ipswich. Yeah, I think it should be, if it's 50 minute ride, eight hours walking? Brilliant. Probably about eight hours, I'd say. So if we're back for 7 a.m., <laughs> I would say that's not bad going. Oh, please, Bonneville, don't let me down, please. 
beautifully presented, isn't it? Yes. I don't think I've ever had this. I'm sure this is an old school meal. Monica's got frangipan, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I haven't heard that name for a while, but that looks delicious. And this is an orange tart. Yeah, yours looks very good too. First class presentation. Really good. I've just been annoying Monica. Can I just give, please, just one more bit of history? Okay. So when the pilgrims landed off the Mayflower into the US, they got into Massachusetts. Monica gets annoyed at this, but it's so fascinating. <laughs> Listen to this. They arrived two months later than they planned to in November, and they hit it right as winter was coming to the USA. Mm -hmm. About half of the original 100 people on the Mayflower died the following few months they had a good harvest so the next year when they had a good harvest one year after about half the people died in the winter they celebrated that with the local people who lived around the area and they called it thanksgiving and that's where the name thanksgiving came from from the first year mm -hmm. of of the mayflower's voyage mm -hmm. one other thing okay. to show the influence that this mayflower voyage had this is massachusetts here Mm -hmm. I'm showing here, this is the USA. Mm -hmm. Just have a look at all of the names. Truro, for example, mm -hmm. there in Cornwall. East Ham, mm -hmm. East London. Chatham in Kent. Mm -hmm. Harwich. No way. Right here. Yeah. It's basically, the English got over here and just thought, we'll call this uh, <gasps> from somewhere we know. South Yarmouth, that's of course England as well. West Yarmouth, why not? And Yarmouth as well. Let's call it that. I'll just do a couple more because it's everywhere. Barnstable mm -hmm. over there. And I could go. Enough. It could go on. And Sandwich in Kent. <laughs> what a name. I mean, the only place you'd call something Sandwich. Yeah. Okay, it just started to rain, so we have to eat these very quickly. What an incredibly rare thing to come across. This is a Lee Francis. Date, this specific car was first registered. First registered. 21st of December, 1928. Wow. It's almost 100 years old. I'll be completely honest. I had to do a registration check on this. I've never <laughs> come across this brand before. Look at the size of the tires. They're so thin, almost bicycle mm. size wheels. Strictly room for two. Cramped cockpit, but stunning. Beautiful. And look at the shape of that boot with the spare wheel on the back. I'm not sure I've ever seen one of these. What a thing to see. And this is just on the street. Almost a hundred year old car on the street like this. Okay, you may wonder why we're walking. That is because I don't trust the Bonneville. Genuinely, I don't trust it to start any more than once. And even if it starts once, I will feel incredibly lucky. So we've had to leave it there next to the waterfront. We're about to head off now to a 110 year old cinema and we'll do it on foot. I think it's about a two minute walk that way. I think we're actually going to be watching a screening of James Bond. So we'll oh. take you. It should be good, yeah. yeah. So we'll have a full tour of that. It's we'll get to watch the film. Uh, no time to die. Okay. I think the latest one. There it is. The Electric Palace Cinema. This was used as a filming location for the most recent series of Downton Abbey. 111 years old. And look at it. This is one of the most intact original examples of one of these old cinemas everything from the original ticket booth and this is the original ticket booth to even the signage admission one shilling in the old british currency it's such a little bit of history that's just been kept and this is a community project in essence, what that means is it's the community that in the 1980s saved this building because it fell into a huge state of disrepair. And for 16 years, it lay completely dormant from around about 1956 to somewhere around the 70s or so with 
openings on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want to book, you can get tickets from the ticket office or go onto their website. Genuinely with this, coming to somewhere like this, you really, really support the local community because the community owns it and they are so keen to share this with everyone. They've got a huge passion for it. It's very interesting talking to Michael who helps uh, on the, the general maintenance and the, and the running of the Electric Palace Cinema because the way it used to work, the poorer members of society, they used to come in along the, the side of the cinema and the entrance was next to the toilets, the loos, right in front of me here. But the richer members of society, they used to come in through the main entrance and come and sit at the comfier seats at the back of the cinema. So the poor members of society would come in along the side and sit on benches here. There'd have been benches right at the front back in about 1911 and the wealthier members on the comfier seats and they would have come in through the front of the cinema. Fascinating, not, from a, not just from a cinematic point of view, but from a, a community, a sociological point of view, a class point of view as well. And it's one of the reasons that, that this cinema has been so important to, to keep hold of that history, that heritage. <laughs> like James Bond. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's very fitting that that's the film we're seeing today. I'm into the original projector room. These are 1950s projectors here. Behind it, we've got the modern projector, which is what they show the new films on. But these are 1950s and pretty much nothing in the cinema has changed. Everything has stayed, even when they have to do the restorations, completely sympathetic to how the cinema was right back in 1911. a very special experience getting to watch James Bond in that cinema and you, you kind of see what cinema used to be I mean it's still amazing going to cinemas but the architecture on the outside of the cinema and the inside of the cinema so getting to enjoy that architecture while watching a film feels like much much more of an event it's a fantastic experience thank you so much to Visit Essex for this past two days thank you so much for everyone for coming along with us on this adventure you can find all of the details for Visit Essex and all of the individual companies in the written description below and I've got one final thing to do it's 10.15 Bonneville please please start first time oh no We cannot end on a more positive note than that. We've got 50 minutes to get home. <laughs> Please, Bonneville, get us home safely. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you in the next one. Have a brilliant week all.